Hey, greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson. I am a forest gardener. No, I am a food wildlife and food forest garden designer. That's my new title. Uh, this is tonight's uh, beginners work forest garden workshop. I will be starting probably in about one and a half minutes at seven o'clock precisely. But um, in the meantime, <laughs> I just wanted to get going just to just to check everything's working okay, and 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 it is. Oh, you can't see my badge. Uh, I've got an Extinction Rebellion badge um, because yeah, we're running out of options on the old um, on the old climate emergency front. I'm afraid to say. So um, yeah, I'm just going to uh, if you haven't already, really help me out um, if you could subscribe. Nope, subscribe. Is that oh good lord? I don't know which way around it is. That way around. My my hands getting mirrored. Um, subscribe to my YouTube account, um, uh, at my YouTube channel, NatureWorks, uh, NatureWorks Garden, YouTube.com forward slash NatureWorks Garden, where you are watching this. That'd be fantastic if you could, because the more uh, subscribers I get, then the more prizes that everybody gets, and I get you know, forest gardening gets more more of a <laughs> an airing, and this kind of free event gets more of an airing as well. So that'd be fab if you could do that. Uh, and oh, I meant to kind of get to people's names together. But thank you for everyone who signed up. I think we've got about half a dozen, I can't remember, about half a dozen people uh, watching tonight. Um, well, should be watching. If not, then that's, <laughs> where are they? Um, and, I'm, and there's the comments on as well. So what I will be doing throughout the, th the first half is gonna be me talking and the next half is gonna be um, you talking in the zoom meeting so you should have your zoom invites with a password so sort that out um, if you haven't got it uh, let me know let me know um, so here we go I'm kind of typing a message out and it's gone out to YouTube and Twitch so it should be live streaming there fantastic right let's get a move on I'm gonna start from the beginning again just one second I'll go back to the beginning Greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson. I am a forest gardener and a wildlife food forest garden designer. That's my rather full and lengthy title because I design forest gardens and uh, I call them food forests because it's easier sometimes and also wildlife gardens because forest gardens are by design wildlife gardens. So this is uh, the workshop is in two parts. So the first hour is me talking about forest gardens and it's an introduction so this is for beginners to forest gardening and the second part from about eight o'clock onwards is a zoom meeting so there might be a little break in between it when i get myself a cup of tea you should have the invite for the zoom meeting there should be a link and a password and uh, yep so if you haven't got that link and password do let me know. Oh, my levels. I don't know if my levels are enough. How about that? Is that louder? Okay. Uh, there are a couple of things. Yep. Yeah, so what I want to get you to get out of this is for you to grow a forest garden. That's basically, I want as many people to grow forest gardens. And this is my small contribution to doing that. Forest gardening is, like any gardening, is that it's vast. It's like masses of stuff to learn, but it's actually really simple. It's putting plants in the ground that you can eat. Uh, and they generally, that's the kind of thing that we're aiming at. And generally, they're perennial plants as well. But what I want you to do is to have, a, have a, um, an, inc an increased awareness of what forest gardening is and why it's different to traditional gardening and what you can do to get involved and create a, gar a forest garden. And it's getting linked up to other people and it's getting linked up to your to your outside space to nature to wildlife to the kind of broader socio-economic political picture in the country about why things are that the way that they are so this is what i want you to kind of get into is is connecting it's all about creating forest gardens so <laughs> uh, if you could um subscribe to my youtube channel that'd be fantastic where you are watching this now that would really help me out because the more subscribers the that the merrier and the, the higher the profile i get and it means i can afford to do stuff there we go uh and then back to the slideshow uh whoa so yeah i will just talk very quickly um yeah 
I do want people to, I, I, I'm not really fussed if you kind of get someone, you do forest gardening with someone else or go and take someone else's course or go, it's brilliant, that's absolutely fine. I'm really into people learning whatever suits them best, whoever they get on with best. Uh, if you do want any help with designing a forest garden, that's what I do. So I have a, a website, nat natureworks.org.uk, and I do forest garden design. And if, yeah, so if you do want any help with it, that's what I do for a living. And I also have courses as well. I've got this course here, which is a real-time workshop. Uh, there's a freebie course, Plan the Backyard Forest, and then there's a Backyard Forest course, which is, a full, which is the full course. So if you want, that's kind of more in depth than, than this free workshop that we're doing tonight. I'll close them down. I have an ancient computer, which is a bit on the old slow side. So tonight then, the, the, the live stream part, this bit here is gonna be in three different sections. There's uh, the three stages really to creating a forest garden. This is really kind of an artificial division, but it helps get it lodged in your head and helps to break it down. Like an awful lot of learning things, it's about breaking it down into manageable chunks. And this is this is for me, this is what works for me, this is how I find it find it works. So the three stages are planning, canopy, and then cultivation. So the three different stages. So the first part is about planning, looking at what you've got, designing and make creating wish lists. And the second part is then to put into the structure, the bones of the garden. It's, it's the canopy. So it's the canopy layer, it's the windbreak hedges, it's dead hedges, and it's getting the perennial hedges started off uh, quickly as well. So that's the kind of structural side. And then the third part is to cultivate. Um, I found it really helpful. I try to do everything all at the same time. As the saying goes, you can do, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. I think it should be, you can, do, you can do anything, but you can't do everything at the same time. I try to do everything at the same time in the forest garden here. And actually what you're better off doing is to do it section by section, work on a bit, get to a state where it's where it's settled in and it can look after itself and then move on to the next section. I'll talk about that later on. Um, the, the cultivation side of it is preparing the ground. Normally, it depends on where you're set up, but normally this would be clearing the grass, planting shrubs and then planting ground cover. Okay. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so remember, plan, canopy, cultivate. There we go. Uh, before you get started, well, it's a bit late now, isn't it? Because you're here, but get this book. This is the book. That's the top of the book there, Creating a Forest Garden. That's the bottom of the book. Um, this is Martin Crawford's book. He's brilliant. He's down in, in Devon, in, in um, oh, not Totnes, near Totnes. Dartington, Dartington College, um, and he has a couple of two, three different sites now, and he does he, he does like trees, lots, lots and lots of trees and shrubs and forest gardening, and he really, really did kickstart the whole forest gardening in the UK. It, it, uh, there, yeah, there's a guy, I won't go to the history of it, but he's kind of really popularised it. So this is a brilliant book. He's he's, he's really, really good. It's got stage by stage different different the different stages and it's also got a whole load of different plants for the different stages as well so it's and then the, then it lists the plants and it's great it's really really useful so ow oh, I've, I've been gardening i've hurt my wrist so i can't i can't hold heavy books in in my in my left hand anyway get that book read it i'll see you back here in a month um so gonna kick off with planning First, first off, really, the, 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 you've got to look at the reasons why people do things. There's lots of reasons to do, to do different things. Uh, my main motivation initially with the, with the garden, with forest gardening, was because of the climate emergency, the ecological and climate emergency. This is a photograph from Australia, hence the kangaroo. Um, two years ago, was it two years ago? 20, crikey Moses, 2020. Um, and... Yeah, ter terrible, awful wildfires in, in Australia. L lots of wildlife died, vast amounts of wildlife died. And it's, yeah, it hasn't really got any better. In fact, it's got a damn sight worse. We've got wildfires in Colorado. I think there's massive temperatures. I don't, yeah, I'm not really kind of keeping tabs on the global climate emergency, but there's a huge, great big iceberg, which is about to shear off from the Antarctic. 
uh, which will tip an awful lot of things. So we're at a really, really dangerous point at the moment. We're kind of like at a tipping point and people aren't doing anything about it, really. it's it's there. There's nothing being done. And I just, yeah, I just want to kind of, yeah, forest gardening is my, is my part of being able to do something about the climate and ecological and climate emergency because every little thing that you do do does make a difference yeah don't you think this is it is on a global scale but it needs everybody getting engaged um what we've got for the um so that's my kind of motivation my reasons for doing for doing things and then we've got to go on to the uh, definition of the forest garden so that's a bit of a downer but uh, yeah so that's uh, a definition of a forest garden and I think this is this is kind of interesting. It's it's essentially I like the the the, the friendly way of describing it is is it, it's growing edible crops in a wildlife garden, and that's the the kind of key idea is that you're growing food to eat, and it's in a wildlife garden, and it's once you've got those two parts in place, then it kind of pretty much not looks after itself because it does require managing but it's far more stable and far more wild than you would normally have in a, in, in, a, in a traditional garden you know either a traditional ornamental garden or in a traditional vegetable or annual vegetable garden and the short definition is an edible ecosystem when you're looking at the a forest garden really martin crawford and um <laughs> your man what's his name the mark the mark the, 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 the chap robert hart they were Robert Hart's like the pioneer of forest gardening in in in, in the UK. Uh, had a garden in Shropshire, uh, much Wenlock, I think it was, and they're designing a garden, and it's for cool temperate climate, which is what the UK has. It's a cool temperate climate, but it would be different. Edible ecosystems look different in different parts of the world. So a forest garden. What I love about the flexibility of this definition of an edible ecosystem is. It kind of depends on what part of the world you're in, and it depends upon the, yeah, your your location, your climate, your weather, your yeah, your the local fl flora and fauna. So it's, it's it's kind of really interesting that it's it's a very flexible kind of definition. Here in the UK, we're really talking about edge of woodland, and I think I might actually put that in. I'm going to put that into my definition. It's edge edge of woodland, edge of woodland. Uh, because it's something which is the further right you go on this this is graph is from from Martin Crawford's book this uh, illustration on the right far right you have arable cultivation which takes up a lot of uh, it takes up it's more fragile takes up a lot of energy and it's it's yeah it's kind of it, it's not really a kind of long -term, viable long term sustainable place to be and the further left you go the more sustainable the kind of more stable uh, it becomes uh, if you just let nature come in the UK, if you let nature run its course, whatever that might be, you end up with the woodland and a forest garden is kind of balanced on the cusp of the woodland. It's a woodland edge and this is what you're trying to emulate. Now, I do want to emphasize here that a forest garden is a garden. It's not wild space. You don't just plant something and let things go. You have to manage them. You have to weed. You do have to look after it, but it's far, far, far less, far less, uh, maintenance far less management than if you had a uh, more traditional garden so there are I've got kind of five kind of key characteristics of a forest garden so first and first and foremost is is it's sustainable you can keep on doing this it's it depends on your definition what sustainable means but really you can have a, a forest garden you can keep it ticking over continually with very few inputs very very little labor and also no no very few external inputs so all the fertility for a forest garden is built into the garden itself you don't import compost you don't generally don't make compost i mean i do make a bit of compost because i've got some plants that yeah you know i pop chuck, chuck them on the pile but they're not it's not like the thing that you do like hot composting in it with an annual vegetable garden with with perennial vegetables and forest garden plants, they're generally much less. Uh, they require far less nutri nutri uh, nutrients, and all those nutrients are provided within the garden itself. Also, you have 
inbuilt uh, inbuilt pest control because you're encouraging the wildlife predators. Strange though it may sound, you want things to eat your plants because that brings in the predators that then keeps it all in the balance. This is what you're aiming at. You're aiming at a balanced garden. You're not aiming at something that you have to keep on maintaining perpetually. It's you let it do its thing, it grows, you harvest it. Okay, you might have to pull out a bramble or an ash sapling or something, but that's pretty much it. Harvesting, maybe weeding something out and then maybe planting some more stuff somewhere else. That's the thing that you're aiming for. Um, it also has a, there is also, it's sustainable in the sense that you're, it's gonna be, it's a carbon negative garden in that it actually sucks carbon in. Once you have a forest, when you have a forest garden established, the trees and the, the, the shrubs and the plants and the soil biota, they're all absorbing carbon and storing carbon, locking it into the ground. So it's actually uh, far more sustainable in that, in that way as well. And the kind of key thing is, while I come onto this, it's wildlife friendly, you're, di you're encouraging biodiversity. So you always kind of use native plants where possible. And just to emphasize again, it's low maintenance. When you have it up and running, it it is much lower maintenance. It still is maintenance, but it is much lower maintenance than an annual vegetable garden or a traditional ornamental garden. The other key characteristic is that it's a productive space. So you are growing, you're, you know, you're growing food or you're growing uh, building materials or basketry materials or herbs or uh, uh, dyes or, or what else have I written down here? Oh, or, uh, you you can gr use it to grow uh, to, to, for for coppicing, for posts or for firewood, or yeah, all sorts of different things. But it's productive, and this is the kind of focus of a forest garden is that it is forest it, that is productive. Um, and I, some people use the term food forest. I generally use the term forest garden, but they're kind of one and the same thing. It's just forest garden conjures up this image of it being like a massive great big space whereas actually it can be in a smaller space uh, it can be in a, in, in, in a you know two meter square you can actually have a forest garden in a very small amount of space I actually set up a forest garden in a big pot just to see if I could and it's kind of interesting interesting little experiment and yes it's productive and it's also productive across in, in all, all the different space so it's it's uses all the available space when I worked on a, in a vegetable uh, market garden, it was all very, very, <laughs> it was all very, um, just, just a single row of vegetables and like a factory out in the field, basically. And it was a good, you know, it's a good, it was a good, it's a good market, market garden, but it really is kind of hard work. Whereas with a forest garden, the, the emphasis is not on uh, uh, mass production of, of food. You actually use all the different spaces. You use the trees, you've got smaller trees, you have shrubs, you've got herbaceous perennials, perennial vegetables, you've got ground cover, you have root, roots and tubers and fungi and climbers. So you're using all the space in there. So it's not just, it hits one crop in this one space. And the fourth, uh, well, hey, the fourth, <laughs> the fourth characteristic is that you're gardening in layers so as i was saying you're using all this available space but you have it's a layered garden so you, the, the, the crops from various parts and finally it's perennial they're generally that the perennial garden no, generally you're using perennial plants because they're low, low maintenance and they're more basically because they're lower maintenance and they're more nutritious and they kind of fix more carbon uh, you do you can use annual plants and I grow tomatoes what do I grow tomatoes and kind of almost perennial chilies and you know I grow some lettuce and bits and pieces around the place but the majority of the plants in the forest garden are, are perennial okay so the the guidelines these are things that I think you should <laughs> these are things I think you should be thinking about at all different stages so when you get a forest garden and you get it going do not be under don't think that you just do it and that's it and you step away it, it is low maintenance but it is it does require looking after and it is a commitment that you have like any garden it's not like there's no such thing i don't think there's any such thing as easy gardening but like any garden there is a commitment to it and these are the things that i think you 
you kind of I come back to time and time and time again I come back to these kind of four kind of guidelines so first is protection always 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 think about protection I'm constantly doing it now I'm constantly putting in new dead hedges and but you know building little structures or walls or all sorts of things so the protection the key protection is from the wind and for that you really need to uh, grow a windbreak hedge so this is a hedge specifically designed to keep out the wind I'll come on to the design side of that in a second whilst the windbreak hedge is getting established you can use dead hedges my favorite nurse tree or dead hedge a nurse tree is just a small shrub that you put in front of the tree that you want to protect and then you'll take that shrub down when it gets too big or when the tree is big enough to look after itself and a dead hedge is four posts in the ground and you put in um, brash old branches and twigs and stuff and that provides temporary protection until the windbreak hedge gets established so uh yep so protection really really important and also there's buildings green tunnel uh, greenhouses and polytunnels and potting sheds and the like as well um the other thing the other guideline is spacing this is apart from windbreaks <laughs> windbreaks spacing getting the spacing right for the trees you plant for final size this is really really important principle you plant for the final size because you want to reduce the amount of maintenance. You, if you want a three meter, a two meter high hedge, don't plant a load of beech. Uh, even though they actually make a brilliant hedge, but they need clipping, and you'll have to you'll spend the rest of your life cutting the hedge back and cutting the hedge back, and you know it's it's an annual task. Whereas if you plant a hedge for the final size, it grows to the final size and it maintains its shape. That's fantastic. That's what you want. There might be a little bit of pruning involved, but generally you let it let it do its thing. Um, so with the trees, when you're planting for the final size, because you're emulating the woodland edge, you want to make sure that there's enough gap between the trees to let the light through for the plants that are growing underneath. And the formula is quarter to a half of the average canopy diameter. Should I write that down here? I don't know if I can. <laughs> quarter to one half average canopy diameter it should come up on your screen now there we go um, and that's the spacing that you want between the between the trees so you work out the average canopy diameter and a quarter to half the spacing it depends if you're on a slope or if you've got space underneath a tree where you have taken the branches up or something but generally that's a, that's a good rule of thumb third thing you want is a uh, ground cover so always 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 keep the ground covered uh, and what you what you will find, and it depends upon whereabouts in the forest garden you're you're doing it. I'm exp you will find that some places you don't need ground cover. For example, I've got a Jerusalem artichoke, which is a big old tall tuber, Helianthus tuberosum, big um, big tubers, and they just set up a load that just grow like crazy. And they'll just swamp out, even though they're herbaceous perennials, that means they die back every every year, all the foliage dies back. Even though they do that, they still manage to pretty much kill off absolutely pretty much everything. You don't really need a ground cover with them. And the same with, I've got Turkish rocket, um, Bunius orientalis. Uh, and this is a sim similar kind of thing. Whereas other plants, I've got some alliums. Um, I've got, ooh, what have I got? There's a perennial leek. And I've got some elephant garlic. And I'm growing, I'm experimenting with other ground cover for for those for those plants because they do they will get swamped. I mean I'm getting some creeping buttercup coming in, so you don't always need ground cover, but you generally it's, it's something that, that is a kind of key characteristic that you always keep the ground covered, whether it's with uh, the perennial vegetables themselves or whether it's with the specific ground cover plants that you're having. And then finally, nutrients. You've got to think about the nutrients that in the in the forest garden. Make a nutrient budget. This doesn't have to be that accurate, but it does have to be thought about so you get roughly the right amount of nutrients going in. And you have nitrogen uh, plant, nitrogen providing plants, which will be a whole range of different plants. Alders, members of the pea family generally. So clovers and oh, uh, uh, Siberian pea tree or broom or that, all, all sorts of different things. Or alders are another uh, nitrogen fixing. They're autumn olive, sea buckthorn, and they're all providing nitrogen. And the other nutrient is potassium. Uh, so nitrogen is generally for is for plant growth, is the, for the green growth, and potassium is for for the flowering and the, for the fruiting bodies. So 
this is yeah this is you want to make sure you've got enough of these in the soil particularly if you have heavy cropping plants so you need to create a nutrient budget that this in martin crawford's book about how to create a nutrient budget as well so there you go that's the introduction to forest gardening and now we're going to get on to making a plan now i did spend quite a bit of time on this before but i'm not going to today i use five mil square paper five mil a3 paper if i was to do i do a lot of uh, work in cad because i do design all the time so it's worth my while learning it for if you're just doing your own garden or just like one or two gardens don't bother i really don't bother um i would stick with paper and sketch sketch and pencil pencil's fine getting the scale is the important thing so that you know when you want to put in a tree which is um i don't know like whoopsie you want to put a tree which is oh come here ah. are you going to zoom in for me you want to put in a tree that is four meters diameter like this one here then you know on a piece of paper how many squares that's going to be so you need to work out your scale that's really really important but you can do it with a piece of uh, with uh, i'll do the outline in pen and then i'd sketch in my plants in pencil and then you can try out different plants in different positions and rub them out and try them out somewhere else so and that's particularly easy i mean yeah yeah, there's various things you can do. If you do want, I, I do have a forest garden uh, planner back in our forest course. So if you're interested in how to create a plan, do have do have a look there for for creating the 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 yeah for creating the the the, the map. What do I call it? I call it a map. Um, yes. So key thing really though is is yeah. So I just want to kind of go back actually. Do make a, a map um, when you're in the planning process. Do create a map, even if it's a really really simple on a bit of a4 paper and you haven't even got the grid on it it doesn't really matter it's just more important to get the ideas down and to try out different things and it could be a scribble but that's fine uh just so long as you're aware of the trees that you want in different places because then this just get, gets you thinking rather than just don't just put trees in the ground because if you don't know <laughs> the diameter they are you don't know if they've got enough space you don't know there's a whole range of other things it's you it's a such a good idea to do a, a map and a plan in the first place because then there'll be less work later on when you if you have to dig up a four-year-old tree that's a lot of work whereas if you kind of play around with it on a piece of paper even if it's a sketch that's a lot that, that's a lot lot easier okay that this is the reason for doing a map this is the reason for sketching it out okay observations um <laughs> so i have a this backyard forest course and it's three and a half hours long and i'm just trying to cram everything into um try trying to cram everything into a, into an hour so observations you've got four different types of observations this is where you're looking around at the land itself first of all you have the position which is your the aspect of the land of your where this is a uh, the nuttery forest garden over uh, just over there and it's looking out across the valley across the Kerry valley and it's south south facing that particular view and yeah and it's got a steep slope on it about 20 degrees so you need to work out what your you know where your where your plot faces where your land faces it doesn't matter what size it is you need to know where is the sun in the sky and where does it you know where how does it affect your your particular space that you have so it's like working out where the the points of the compass for your for your for your map then you have a look at the elements and this is the water how much water wind sun and earth so work out with the rainfall is there a, a wet patch and a wet place in the garden is there a very dry place in the garden is there a stream in the garden is there any kind of um oh dra uh, pooling water um all, all these kind of things where how does the water flow how is the water on the landscape what is the water retention like what does it dry out very quickly uh, associated that is, is is the earth so the type figure out the type of earth that you have and whether it's clay sand or loam and then you also need to look at the wind as well the prevailing wind generally in the uk is from the southwest but do check where you live and you want to protect against the wind this some if you're in a in a protected space place space then it's not so much of an issue but if you're on a side of a hill like there then that that does that does make a difference and then the sun just need to know 
where the sun is. I didn't realize <laughs> until I started gardening the, um, just like how how much the sun changes its position in the sky. And when it, in the winter, this time of year, it, set, it rises over there, sets over there. And in the summer, it rises all the way back over there and sets all the way back over there. And it gets higher in the summer and then lower in the winter. This is to do with the our position on the globe and the tilt of the globe on the axis on, on its axis or something. Oh, I can't remember. Okay, excuse me. One second. I've just like um, yeah. I've got I've got young children screaming next door. Oh, a bit of spam. That's nice. Um, Okay, and then situation is just like where you, whereabouts you are in the landscape. So do have a look at for your neighbours and where your neighbours are situated. And this is in terms of privacy and also noise and smell and foot traffic and all sorts of other things as well. But how that will influence how you design the garden and what bits you want to screen off, what bits you want to open up, and what kind of space you want to create in that in that in that garden. There's a very useful app called uh, Sun Surveyor, uh, Sun Surveyor, I think it's sunsurveyor.com, I think so, yeah, that'll do, and that's brilliant, really, really useful app, and I use it an awful lot, and what you can do, it tell you where the sun is in the sky at different times, I've just got to go and, um, just got to go and, Sorry about that, just had to go and shout at the children. Um, okay, and so that's a really, really useful app to have, sunsurveyor.com, and you get it on Android, you get it on iPhone as well, and it'll tell you the position of the sun throughout uh, all different times of the year, so you can see winter time where the sun will be, the height of summer where it will be, at the equinox where, where will the sun be, and this can allow you to plan the height of uh, windbreaks and the height of trees as well. So and see how much light will get into certain parts of the garden. So it's really, 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 really useful. Okay, and then that will do. That's oopsie, I clicked on the wrong screen. So the next bit then. Whoa, the next bit is plays of wish lists. I got three. I got. I create a wish list. Um, it's a shame because I haven't really got that. I haven't got that much time. But the kind of wish list, there's the firstly, it, the different, yeah, I'd create different wish lists. So I'd create a, like a general purpose wish list, a plant and a plant wish list, and then a picture wish list. So I'm going to make a note of that as well. Um, oopsie. So first of all, general wish list. I'm going to make a note. So, so I'm just lagging a little bit. Um, a general wish list is for uh, the different features in your garden. I always kind of start off, because you're designing gardens with wildlife in mind, because you want to create an edible ecosystem, you want a balanced ecosystem in the garden, always design with wildlife first and foremost in your, in, in, in your, in your head. Um, so you're designing habitat, and you're designing food, and you're designing shelter, and you're designing water, f food, uh, water source. Um, Ponds are always fantastic as well, and for they kind of cover an awful lot of bases. Uh, and then think about uh, the nutrients. Always think about the nutrient budget that you have, and think about seating. I've got a phrase which is uh, coffee, <laughs> coffee and cocktails. So whereabouts would whereabouts in your garden would you have a coffee, which gets the morning sun, and whereabouts in the in your garden would you have a cocktail, uh, and you catch the evening sun. So these are two different places, and um, Think about putting seating there if they're in e within easy reach of the house. So it just gets you thinking about the space and how you can use that space. And then structures. What kind of structures would you like? Sheds, polytunnel, greenhouse, potting shed, uh, water water butt from the from the from the roof to get the rainwater harvesting. Uh, yeah, all all sorts of different things. Think about what you want and just put everything down, and you can always take things away. For the plants. Uh, plant wish, wish, for the plant wish list, <laughs> I would uh, use a website called Plants for the Future. Brilliant, brilliant website. Uh, has a whole lot of different plants on it. it. Gives you the size, the height, the diameter, the uses, uh, 
flowering times, all sorts of different stuff. So go and choose a list of plants that you would like and just again put everything down because you can always take things away later on. And then finally, uh, picture uh, Pinterest. I use Pinterest a lot for for gathering pictures. Um, yeah, it's kind of handy. It's handy to be able to do that to have a space, a place where you can just jot down a load of pictures. And then what I do do is, oh, you can't see, but I've got a lot of uh, photographs and printouts of postcards and all and designs and sketches all over the walls. Things that I find inspirational. Um, and do the same thing for the kind of plants that you like and the. Uh, the features that you like as well and put them up put them, just print them out and put them up few e so that's your planning all done and dusted and this process the planning process can take you know you can take it it can take a it can take a, a while It'll take your time with it don't feel you have to get everything done in, the, in, in a matter of days um, and then design now this is why <laughs> This is why you design stuff. This is why I say put the right, you know, put the right tree in the right place with the right spacing, because you don't want to end up with a giant sequoia at the back of your back door. So purposefully put things in the right place, and figuring out the right place is always a uh, always a bit difficult. And I was saying before, design on paper. This is a friend's map. He's actually cut out little circles of for trees and things, uh, which is which is great. So another great thing about having a paper map is that you can then start to add the observations to the map and also you can add your wish list so you can say oh polytunnel where should we put the polytunnel what size should it be if you ever do have a polytunnel by the way uh, orientate orient it north to south because you get more equal sun on all sides of it if you rather than if you orientate it east to west you get uneven amounts of sun on the on, on the uh, polytunnel on the different sides um yeah so how big should the polytunnel be? Where could it go? Easy access to the house. I always kind of work from the center from the, from the house itself. And then use circles for trees. Or you can use a pencil. And then I, I think probably pencil would be just would be just as good in some respects. Yeah, try, try it out. And then the design order. Um, I think it's like really kind of important uh, you got you got different you got different plants to go in. You have different dif different trees and things that you like to put in. But I kind of more and more of the uh, the kind of idea that paths are really really useful ways to access different places and to divide up different areas and different places. So there's like a, a I went into a park today, took the dog out and I ended up in a park in in town, and it's got a path that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> It does a loop in the middle of the grass, and it doesn't go to the river. It doesn't go to the river that way, and it's just it's a it's pointless. It's a really pointless path. So you have to go all the way around and then cut across to the to the river. Like have a path that goes somewhere, and that somewhere could be somewhere that you haven't designed yet. So it could be a seating area that you haven't designed, but a path goes somewhere, and it defines the different areas. So I think paths are actually really really useful part of this kind of process I mean, I've got design I'm doing at the moment for a client down in Surrey and it's going to be really interesting actually how to how to divide up the different space and to divide up the divide the garden up and what the focus is going to be in, e in each space and what the trees are going to be so but I think paths really are the kind of way to think about going from one place to another and then having a like this is where you're going you've got to go and sit down or you're going to go to the polytunnel or you're going to the pond or you're going to the exit of the far end of the garden or you know but it, it links stuff together so it's a really nice really nice way to do it and then put the structure attach the structures put the structures on the on the map and then try trees out in different places so there we go we how are we doing on time 40 minutes cool so i'll be going for another 20 minutes have a little breather for a second and i'll just check to see if i have any uh, comments through oh i've got vortex for go i've got spam spam coming in in the comments but if you do if there is anybody watching who would like to <laughs> say anything now is the time there we go Okay, on to the canopy uh, layer. So, and I say canopy layer in a kind of broad sense. Canopy is in trees, but also it, it's more like the structural side. Maybe I'll change the title of it. Canopy to structural. Oh, I'll write that down. 
canopy to structure. So there is uh, the most, as I was saying before, in the design guidelines, really, really important thing, look at protection. And first and foremost, look at windbreaks, creating windbreaks. If you have an exposed site at all, you need to have a windbreak in there to protect the plants because the plants will grow far more healthily, far more quickly and get established far more quickly if they have protection there. So ideally you want to have a living windbreak hedge because they are also can provide crops. So this is a Rosa rugosa, Japanese rose um, hedge at Martin, one of Martin Crawford sites down in Devon. And it provides habitat, it's thorny, it provides roses and pollen and, and nectar, and it provides hips, which are edible. Um, so yeah, so it's doing more than, yeah, it's doing more than one thing. Uh, but whilst it gets established, think about setting up a dead hedge. So a dead hedge is a um, dead hedge is a brilliant as well. So a dead hedge is a sta is a a po some posts with filled with old bits of wood, old branches and brash bits of stuff that you cut off, hedge trimmings or old brambles, all sorts of things. And they'll I I just find it really really. Um, I find it really useful to have uh, dead hedges about the place because they're a good place to put all the bits and all the trash that you have in the garden, which previously I used to burn, but now I've just filled up my dead hedges and they're provided protection whilst the living windbreak hedge gets established. And then a nursery, as I said before, a nursery is a small, like a small shrub that you can plant in front of uh, a tree, a, 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 a specimen tree, like a fruit tree that you want to grow, that you want to protect. Uh, what I found here in West Wales, the one of the best plants is uh, Scotch broom because it's, uh, it's it's easy to manage and it's easy to pull up when you don't want it as well. And then you have polytunnels as well. Uh, as uh, Polytunnels actually act as a windbreak, but for obviously for plants within the polytunnel. Um, okay, when you're designing your... I'm going to take off polytunnel page 17 um, when you're designing your windbreaks the key measurement for that is to think of, of it's the height protects eight times the length that's the key kind of measurement so if you have a two meter high uh, windbreak that will protect for 16 meters so if you have a 32 meter uh, wide garden then you need a four meter hedge. But what you can do, you can actually have two rows of one, you can have you can, ex you can have a sequence of uh, windbreak hedges. It doesn't have to be four meters high and then nothing, all forest garden and then the other windbreak. You can actually have one two meter windbreak and then another two meter windbreak in the middle of the garden and then another two meter windbreak on the other side and that'll provide protection across across the whole of the garden. Uh, so, it de but it really depends upon the situation. Uh, well, I'll just come on to it in a second. And if if you have a very windy site, then double the thickness. Uh, have a double thickness windbreak hedge if you can afford the space. It really, really is worth it. It will make for everything else far more productive, and it doesn't take up that much extra space. So it's like a zig. You plant a zigzag. And the density of the windbreak that you're planting, really, it depends. Um, are planting half a meter to one meter, depending upon how quickly the plants grow, and how much, how quickly you can get the space, the how quickly the space will fill up between the between the windbreak hedge plants. Um, the key thing, though, is the aspect dictates the height. So your height of your windbreak hedge is determined by which direction it's facing. So taller hedges to the north. Um, to the north side, so they can be they will shade out your neighbour, but to, as tall as can <laughs> as can be allowed, and and the taller hedge is also to the east. Sun um, sunlight from the west is generally more valuable than sunlight from the east, and that's because the in the in sunlight from the west, the plants have the air has been warmed up by the sun, and the plants plants will photosynthesize more readily with warmer air because it's been warmed up all day. So 
you, the, you get more focus emphasis with western sunlight than you will with eastern sunlight. So you can have taller wind breaks on the east, shorter on the west, and then the shortest of all in the south. So like you, you get the full sun there. This isn't to say don't have a wind break on the south side, but think about having a low wind break and then maybe another wind break further back. Uh, so again, this is a screenshot from the Sun Surveyor app, really, really useful. And you can see where the sun is at what time of year. And yes, check the prevailing wind. Um, when you have a wind break, this is a uh, staggered gap. Apparently, uh, the vertical profile is better for protection um, for a wind break. So it's better to have that with the wind and it comes, it goes straight up rather than having a, 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 gra a gradated kind of a gradient on the on the on the windbreak that doesn't work as well apparently so vertical profile is better for protection but it might not sit so well in the landscape um i must get like a sketch as well. i'm just going to write this down as well canopy to structure um add sketches windbreak profile <laughs> Um, I've got an ancient computer and it really is it's I can't type and live stream at the same time I god knows how people manage to play games and live stream and gaps okay might be time to get a new computer um, so yeah you can have a baffle island gap whereas you have a gap I'll, I'll, add, I'll add some pictures to the to the next next month's you have a gap and then you have another a, a little mini hedge on the other side so that's a, like an island gap this is a staggered gap and you can have an angle gap as well where you, you go through that there's actually a uh, if it's a thick hedge you can cut an entrance through at an angle and then perennial vegetables and this kind of is funny perennial vegetables is um putting into i, I will change the canopy to structure um perennial vegetables why are they in the canopy because i think it takes a while it, perennial vegetables are the most immediately productive kind of plants that you can have in a forest garden and yeah you know, what is a perennial vegetable really but but they they they're gonna get cracking so you've got perennial kale you have oh jerusalem artichoke or perennial leeks or per perennial potato onions or you know a whole range of different perennial vegetables but they do take a while to get established so i think it's really really useful to set up a perennial veg area which is one of the first areas that you do and get the perennial veg in because they will take a while you know i bought a dozen potato onions from allison at backyard larder and it's taken three years to get like a bed full of potato onions so i kind of get started first of all with that with the pars in a perennial in a with a perennial veg make sure you have access i have beds it was an annual vegetable uh set of six annual vegetable beds and I had the beds 1.5 meters apart, 1.5 meters wide, and that's too wide. You really, to be honest, you get away with one meter. One meter wide bed is plenty, plenty enough. So you've got access from both sides, and make sure you get decent paths in there. I'm using, I'm transitioning to using uh, wood chip paths around the beds because it's it's easy to maintain, it's cheap to fill up. I fill it up every year or so, and I maintain it with a hoe just to get rid of the weeds and put signage up everywhere as well so people know what is growing where. So when people say, I want to get, I want to have oh, the salad leaves or salad plants or something, you can direct people who don't know about perennial vegetables. It helps with that and get it close to the kitchen and, and pay it, pay perennial veg, pay them attention. You know, do, don't just ignore them, otherwise, other things will grow. <laughs> Speaking from bitter experience, here's some perennial vegetable links. The um, backyard larder is one of the best. Uh, is, is is she's great? Alison Tyndale at backyard larder. She's great. She's really really good and has a lot of different vegetables. Mandy Barber, incredible vegetables, um, is brilliant as well. Um, she was on Gardening World actually a couple of three four months ago. Stephen Barstow at Edimentals uh, is brilliant. Loads and loads of information. He's written a book about it. Alan Carter, oh, that's it, Plums and Pignuts. It's actually Food Forest Garden now. He's changed that. I'll write that down, hold on. Foodforest.garden, Alan Carter. He's he's great as well. He has lots of experience of actually growing the plants rather than saying, oh, try this one, uh, because that's something I saw on the internet. He actually grows them and gives his opinion of them. And he's up in Aberdeen, so it's kind of 
it's useful to see what works and what doesn't work there. Stephen Barstow is in Norway, so again, really kind of interesting. Um, and then Plants for Future, uh, PFAF.org, it's really, really good. Hold on, I'm just gonna change plums and pig nuts, there we go. Um, and then onto the canopy trees themselves, so get make sure you've got your windbreaks in. Again, get the spacing right, quarter to a half of the average canopy diameter. And you need to make sure you choose the right rootstock. For cultivated fruit trees, uh, cultivated, yeah, cultivated, yeah, cultivated fruit and nut trees, generally they have, uh, they are grown on the rootstock. So they are a clone, a cutting that is grafted onto a rootstock. And it's the rootstock which determines the height and the vigor of the tree and that will give you your final height and the, and the diameter as well and you need to know that so that you get the right trees size tree for that space that you want to put it in okay so choose the right rootstock and if you're growing any fruit tree or nut tree make sure you have pollinating partners that, s that some fruit trees will require a uh, another fruit tree that will plant that will flower at the same time if you've got an apple tree if you've got space get a crab apple because that will pollinate for a much longer period and will pollinate all the apples uh, but again it's worth doing some research about it i won't I haven't really got time for that at the moment uh, there is orangepippin.com is a really really good website for looking at pollinating partners orangepippin.com i'm going to write that down here pollinating pollinate partners and then finally, with your trees, because it's so important to get the right tree in the right place, measure twice, plant once. You've got a map, but the map might not be accurate or there might be something in the way or the soil might, might not be right. So always measure twice. Always make sure you've got the right space. Measure on the ground to see that you've got the right space for it. Phewy, there we go. On to part three. Oh, not bad, not bad at all. Uh, have I got any more comments? No, no more comments. So this is... Uh, Part three, so plan we've done, canopy we've done, and we're on to the cultivate part of the of the forest garden. So on to cultivation. So cultivation, let's get this sorted out. Ah, pars. So whenever you're designing a garden, as I said before, I'm, I'm a big fan of using pars to define specific areas. And it's so much easier to deal with a garden area by area than to go, I have to do everything all at the same time, which is what I have suffered from myself in the past. Uh, so now um, I've got all the paths in place and all the areas of all need to kind of rejuvenating. Uh, you do have, right, so paths, if you've got a large space, then use grass paths because they're they're cheap, they're hard wearing. Uh, grass grows like crazy. That's the, the 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 benefit of grass, but the the downfall of grass is that it cheaps. It's cheap, it's hard wearing, and it grows like buggery. So it's it's kind of like it's good in particular situations, but it will spread and it will kind of take over stuff. So. I've been yeah doing an awful lot of cutting the reducing the amount of grass throughout the whole garden bit by bit. I've got a, quite a lot more to do deturfing and then around the high um, high volume areas like this is around the the compost bay. I use wood chip um, and rather than using bits of wood, which is, these are only ever temporary, I've now planted a line of like a boundary plants like a it's a geranium geranium uh, macrorhizum. And I planted a line of really big sturdy geraniums down the side of the grass path. So they all shade out the grass so it won't grow in to the wood chip. Um, and I've done the same thing on the other side here by the polytunnel as well. But this takes time to kind of establish the grass. But grass paths are good for large areas. For small areas, high, high, uh, high traffic, a cheap way of doing it is to use wood chip. You do need to maintain the wood chip, so I'll go out with a hoe every couple of months, and I'll kind of get rid of the the dandelions and the, the oxalis and yeah, wood sorrel or whatever it is that's growing there, and just kind of keep the path clear. And then I'll top up with wood chip as well every now and again when I get some more wood chip in. Uh, if you you know if you've got this really small garden, then it's worth yeah, a much smaller garden. It's worth putting in a hard surface, and it's also the hard surface is actually you know like a, a paved garden or, or gravel. 
or I'm looking at a thing called hogging. Actually, that's a good point because I need to <laughs> I need to find out about that. Um, I'm looking at creating a hogging path, uh, which is a clay uh, clay mix. I'm going to write that down as well. Hogging path. Um, so, but it, a hard surface, uh, pave like paving slabs or gravel. It's more expensive, so it's it's harder wearing, so it's better for a smaller space, but it gets really pricey. Like you scale up a garden, it gets really pricey, and they still do need to be maintained as well. So what path you choose depends upon your, you know, depends upon your setup and, the, and your size. So in terms of timing, with the cultivation, I will, uh, again, just to kind of reiterate, I would start off with a design for a garden and I'll put in the, the canopy layer. So I'll put in the windbreaks and the canopy trees and the structures and then define the areas with paths and then work on each area, one area at a time, unless you've got a, a decent sized budget, which is great to do the whole lot all at the same time, but work on one area at a time and then put in your ground cover and your shrubs one area at a time. But the reason for this is that it's a lot easier to concentrate your efforts on one specific place and get it get it done and get it planted up and keep it weeded for the first couple of years and also because it's, it's a question of cost because you're using about three to five plants per square meter like a 10 by 10 meter square uh, area is 400 plants and that's an awful lot of plants so if you're buying plants for three pounds at uh, three pounds a pot from a from a nursery that's you know you spent twelve hundred pounds, which is ridiculous. So what you can do is, if you grow your own ground cover plants, then you can uh, do, and you're doing one area at a time. You can fill that area up and then work on the next area, and that gives you time for the for the ground cover plants to get to to regrow. So you kind of you, you grow your own plants to provide for the different areas, and you don't not doing it all in one go, but you're doing it over a number of years. Yep. So that might well be the best best way of doing it. In terms of mulch, um, so that's yeah, it's the timing. This is so this is really kind of key. The reason do work on one area at a time. Yep. Well, you want to clear the ground, so you've you've got your different areas. You've got your your path set up. You have your your canopy layer, wind breaks different areas and then you're going to clear the area normally this is of grass so we've got like a, a one acre field over that side and it's uh, it's covered in well it was covered in grass it is increasingly come covered in grass again um if you've got a small area manually deturfing is best uh, i use a turfing iron and that's the easiest way of doing it if you if it's um a medium you know, like a, a smallish area use cardboard i have a job on um local job and I'll be getting some cardboard from the bike shop because they have big, big sheets of the cardboard that the bikes come in. Um, and if you've got a much bigger space, then I'd, I'd use a, a mini digger, uh, hire a mini digger in for a day or two, and then scrape the just the just the top layer of the turf, not the top soil, just the top layer of turf, and then use that somewhere else for landscaping um, because that's. It's a lot of work. I, I used to use woven plastic sheet mulch, but it just it degrades. There's threads of plastic everywhere, and it's plastic, and it ends up in the bin. So I'm I'm not I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so yeah, do propagate your own um, shrubs and your own ground cover plants, or <laughs> because it's much cheaper. As I say, you you know you're looking at. Uh, for a 10 meter square area you're looking at 400 odd plants that's an awful lot of plants so aim for easy plants so comfries ground cover small dwarf comfries strawberries root di different raspberry species um, rubus species and and aim for native plants as well because uh, native plants again uh, you you want to have native plants in a forest garden as a as a bulk of the plant because their native plants have co-evolved with the uh, native wildlife so they actually provide more of a food source than non-native plants generally um, so aim for and aim for ground cover plants as well ground cover plants because there's just so many of them it's much much cheaper to propagate them for yourself but you can also propagate shrubs and you can propagate trees as well and when you come out to plant the different areas so you've cleared the ground you've propagated your ground cover plants and your shrubs and then you have this expanse of bare soil now first thing you do is to put a mulch down uh, some people kind of differ on how they approach this this is this is how I do it so I've got the, the bare ground 
I'll put a bark mulch down. You can use wood chip, but what in my experience, wood chip uh, decomposes far more quickly than bark. A bark is far more inert and will last for longer and put it, provide uh, cover whilst the, the ground cover plants get established. So generally, I prefer to use a bark mulch as, as um, uh, when I'm planting up an area. Then put your shrubs in, and you can see here I've done a little chalk circle <laughs> around where the shrub is going to go, and this is the space that it will take up. And make sure you've got the spacings right as well between the shrubs. And then you put, then you plant out the ground cover plants, and you plant them out about three to five ground cover plants per square meter. Uh, and the really critical part is adding temporary ground cover. This is just like an annual green mulch uh, like the one I use is white mustard um, and that that works really well here in West Wales only only last one year and whilst that just that shades out other plants to stop them from competing with the ground cover plants that you put in okay and then for the shrubs themselves um, I will put in, uh, there, there are three different types of, <laughs> there are three, there are loads, there are thousands of different species of shrubs that you can have. And it's a, there's a, Martin Croft has written a whole book on shrubs and they're great and I could talk for hours and hours about them. But I just look at three different types of shrubs. You've got soft fruit, sh shrubs for windbreak and shrubs for nitrogen fixing. Um, so soft fruit, uh, aronia berries, I'd say there's one bush that if you can get hold of, I mean, they're great, Ar aronia. Um, chokeberry, yeah, chokeberry. Lots of different species, different sizes, and uh, cultivated. There's some cultivated smaller species as well. Uh, but then black currants and all sorts of all sorts of different fruit. Um, so soft fruit, windbreaks. This is like the 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 shrubs that you're putting in for a windbreak hedge. Uh, again, native species where you possibly can nitrogen fixing as well, and some some plants do all three so their autumn olive is does all three that's um i'll spell it for you autumn olive and uh, this grows about five meters by five meters high by about four meters wide and it's nitrogen fixing it's a windbreak and it has edible berries on it particularly the name cultivars but sea buckthorn is um sea buckthorn is the has four it does four it's a soft fruit it's a windbreak. It's nitrogen fixing, and it's a native to native to the UK. That is, it's a native plant. So that's um, that's a, that's one to watch out for. It does sucker, and it's very spiny as well. So you need to put it in the right place, and it's quite big. So shrubs weeding, you do need to weed, particularly in the first two years. Make sure you keep the grass out, the bramble, the dock tree saplings keep them out first two years is absolutely critical yeah i worked on a job last year and didn't weed it for various reasons i wasn't around during the summer and it's gone to grass and it's a real real shame so much work gone into planting out the ground cover it hasn't been weeded it's going to have to be mown from now on and then start again with it but there we go if you are weeding uh for saplings grass bramble and dock rip them out take them out by the roots other stuff like, oh, I don't know, uh, plantain or dandelion. I, to be honest, I just leave most of it. Depends where it is. If it's if it's encroaching on something that I, I really want, then I'll, I'll, I might take it out. But you can do what's called scissor weeding, where you just chop off the top of the plant, leave the roots in the ground. Because the more you disturb the ground, the more seeds, the wild, uh, weed seeds will get dispersed. And you're actually better off sometimes just to, just to cut it back a little bit. And then a chop and drop mulch. So I always plant a, a, a comfrey. This is a non uh, non fertile country called bocking 14 um bocking 14 and i plant one next to every every fruit tree and then i'll just uh, twice a year i'll do a chop and drop mulch around it i'll just chop it back and then put a mulch around the base of it and that provides nutrients so just to kind of um reiterate break it down into plan canopy and cultivate i've got some references here and this is uh, Martin Crawford's Creating a Forest Garden book. There's a forest garden spreadsheet which lists every single plant. I've made this. Um, I've made this spreadsheet with a with a couple other people, Ollie and Chris. Bit dot bit dot Lee forward slash forest hyphen garden hyphen spreadsheet. 
and that's a spreadsheet of all the plants in there. It's online, it's sortable, it's fab. It uses data from Plants for a Future, which is a great big database. RHS Plant Finder is handy as well. It's got a native filter on it. And there's Orange Pippin for fruit tree reference. There we go at the end. Thank you very, very much for watching. Right, so I'm going to go and go over onto um, Zoom in a second. Oh, I've got a, 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 mess, a question. So, JL, JL Cook. Um, I'll just say I'll just uh, say thank you very much for watching now, and I'll answer the question in a second. So thank you very much for watching. On to the question: Any thoughts about using animals to clear turf? No, actually, no thoughts at all. Um, I think the problem is with using animals. That the only kind of time when I've come, the only time when I've had animals in that have cleared the turf, possibly pigs. Yeah, I know that I had some friends who had pigs, um, and they. They did, they, they, it was a quagmire. And I know pigs are actually very useful for clearing bramble uh, because they will dig up the bramble root. And um, yeah, bramble's a pain. Don't, yeah, that's a whole other, whole other topic. But for clearing grass, I guess you could use pigs. I guess you could. Um, the thing about pigs is you need to provide them, provide them with, you need to be secure. I know you can use electric fencing for cattle. I don't know if you, you can use electric fencing for pigs as well. That'd be a cheaper way, cheap way of doing it. And they need they need food and water and shelter in that space that you're using. But yeah, that's poss quite quite possibly. I, I think I, I think pigs would trash it enough. Possibly, don't yeah, don't know. Be be an interesting one to to see. Um, what we have done here. Um, oh, chickens will do it. How many chickens, Peter? This is this is Pete uh, um, asking a question. Chickens will clear turf. Um, how many chickens and how long have you got? I can just imagine you have an acre of uh, pasture and then it's like 3,000 chickens just put out into the field and say, go for it, go for it, chickens. Do your worst. And then 24 hours later, it'll be a mud bath. <laughs> Oh, you can use electric fences with pigs, yeah. So, but I, 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 I'd just be a little bit wary about that because I don't know how much of the roots will be taken up depending upon the on the turf. But I've, I have never done it, so I don't have the experience of it. So, so yeah, it's quite, quite possible. Okay, right then, I'm going to zoom over to Zoom. Um, thank you all very much for watching, and uh, I shall see you over in Zoom if you've got the invite. I'll see you over there. Um, thank you very much. Okay.